Hi everyone, welcome back to the Dr. Sia channel. In the video here today, we're going to be talking about cancel culture. It's a controversial topic, there are many sides to it, and I thought I am fed up with being quiet about it. I want to share what I have to say here on YouTube and to whoever might care about what I have to say. Look, you might already have made up your opinion, it might change, it might not, you might, after this, cancel me, which is within your right to do, but uh, please don't. Uh, let's get started. All right, so cancel culture. Now, in this video here, uh, I'm going to be talking about both sides to uh, just explain what I see, what I believe this is all about, what's happening for the different sides, what was meant to happen, and hopefully at the end of this uh, rant that I have here today, I'll actually be able to think about maybe a way forward from here, however, however much uh, a way forward is obviously going to likely offend people as well. But anyway, you know, we're not here to, to play it safe. So let's just talk about, firstly, what, in my opinion, in my perception, what was happening for me and because what might what was happening for me might be what was happening for you as cancel cancel culture kind of grew uh, this time around apparently cancel culture has been around for a long time but uh, this time around when it came around what was it about and what how did i experience that so i remember when it first started with that uh, there was some hollywood producer and uh, bill cosby and kevin spacey and r kelly and i remember as these as these people were getting canceled it was almost like i felt like well that's right they should be canceled um i don't want to listen to them anymore i don't want to have anything to do with them anymore now that i know what they've been on about what they've been doing you know it felt like these criminals had been walking around among us unconvicted or non-convicted for a bunch of crimes literal crimes that they have committed including things like rape and child abuse and sexual harassment and and so on and so on i think that that i think that kind of encompasses it, um, mostly all of it correct me if i'm wrong put something in the comments if i'm wrong and by the way if you're down in the comments subscribe while you're at it and and, and you know press a like the more likes this video gets the more likely that it kind of pops up in the youtube algorithm so please if you are watching it take the time just press that I can come back watching it again. So it, it's that like it was it was it, there was a sense of justice in that or at least I would kind of go yeah no nah, makes sense people do crime police catch them they go to prison. Well they're not going to be out making any movies and singing songs and producing anything if they're in prison. So it wasn't kind of a, a sense that I have to cancel these people now. It was just kind of a natural progression of how things happen. You do crime, you go to prison if the police catch you, right? That's just the way things should be. But then I thought about it and I was like, that's not exactly accurate because I've been blasting Michael Jackson on my speakers and I've been hearing people blast Michael Jackson at parties I still hear it now and again when I walk past, if it's nighttime and I walk past the pub or something, you know, I might hear, you gonna, you gonna. And I'm like, okay, well, that's, you know, that, you know, you know, that's Michael Jackson blasting in there. So we didn't cancel him. And I think eh, there's a lot to say that, you know, the guy was up to no good with kids. I mean, you know, is he a pedophile? I don't know. I don't want to kind of throw that out there. Has he done a lot of inappropriate things? Is that undeniable? Is that undeniable? And if you do a lot of un uh, 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 and not appropriate things with kids, it's probably because you're a pedophile. You know what I mean? It's that kind of like, you don't want to, you don't want to attack the guy. You don't want to say it. You don't want to say it. You don't want to say, Michael Jackson, who I've listened to my whole life, is a pedophile. It's hard to say. It creates all kinds of mixed feelings. I'm just saying that. And hey, look, maybe he is, maybe he's not. And I'm back to denial again, right? And this is how I spiraled around myself over and over again, going, trying to deny the truth so I can enjoy his songs and then enjoying his songs and needing to deny the truth and then being blatantly kind of thrown some truth 
on TV or news or something in my face. And then it got hard again to, to, to deny the what may be the obvious truth. And like you see here, I still can't make my mind up. Did he do those things to those kids? Was he a pedophile? Is it all a big conspiracy and a ruse against Michael Jackson? I don't know. You tell me. Put it down in the comments. So, the, I, but the cancel culture point was when it first started out that these people do harm, do genuine nasty harm, and we cancel them out. We stop seeing them. And it was kind of a natural thing that was kind of sprung on by media. You know, this guy is a pedophile. Listen to him if you want. Don't listen to him if you don't want. But then it started changing. It started going from obvious harm, uh, blatant crime, to hurt. To I feel hurt. It started shifting into... When someone said that, that hurt my feelings. That person's political position hurts my feelings. That person's critical and judgmental stance hurts my feelings. So, for example, someone comes up and they're homophobic. And, of course, I am not. That hurts my feelings because I have a lot of gay friends, because I find it offensive, because I think that gay people are just people, just like all other people who are people. That hurts my feelings when they say things like that. I, myself, I'm a brown person, right? I'm a brown person, and I would hear a lot of negative things about me being a brown person. Now, if you're a brown person out there, you've heard a lot of things that are bad about being a brown person. Now, you might also have heard that if you're white, if you're brown, if you're black, if you're anything else, whatever, you know, you're from East Asia or you're from West Asia or you're from South America, wherever you might be, there might be different looks associated with your country and your nation and your kind of area and so on and so forth. And all of us have in one way or another possibly felt how we have been discriminated against for one reason or another. And it hurts. It hurts when someone's discriminating against us. It hurts when someone judges us. It hurts when someone criticizes us. And it can even hurt when someone jokes about us. I remember back when 9-11 happened and basically every comedian in the world went to town on talking about uh, Middle Easterns, you know, Arabs. And, and, and if you mention the name Iranian, it was like, well, it was synonymous with terrorists. And in America, to some extent, it still is. You see, Iranian, first thought that pops up in a lot of American heads, is a terrorist. Now, I kind of have to live with that. And I also have to live with that, basically, that I love stand-up comedy. And every stand-up comedian that I liked at the time I had to have a dig at, you know, at Iranians, at Arabs, at anyone else who's from the Middle East, at anyone who even looks a bit like the Middle Eastern, or if they're kind of Indian or Pakistani or whatever else they might be, they were immediately labeled terrorists. Now, that would hurt when they would do that. Here is uh, a favorite person of mine that I listen to all the time, and suddenly he's going, Hamala, 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 Hamala. That's what, the, that's what Arabic sounds like. That's what Iranian sounds like. That's what these people, Hamala, Hamala. And you hear the audience go, ha, 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 ha. That's so funny. Ah, it's so funny because that's exactly what that is. That's exactly what that language is. Ha, 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 ha. That's what that language is. All right. I felt hurt. Now, how do I deal with that hurt? Here's a person who I liked, who I've always liked, who I thought was on my side. And apparently in this moment, all they can do is racist jokes. Now, do I think that that person suddenly deserves to lose their career because I felt hurt? Well, if you ask cancel culture, they do. Cancel culture stopped being about crime and started being about feeling hurt. It started being about making sure that anyone who has an idea or a thought or an opinion that is hurtful to another group of people, that this group of people, I don't even know who they are, lynch together, so to come together and lynch this person out, create as much public um, and, uh, 
pressure, as much media pressure as possible, that the company that that person works for goes, no, we think we're going to lose money from this. We think that this is actually going to cost us some money. So we'd rather have this person out than in. There'd be all these media troubles in, in getting someone to watch them. We might, for example, lose subscribers or we might, for example, lose viewers or we might have a concert that is completely empty and we lose money and so on and so forth. We don't want to do that. Let's not put up any more of their shows because there's 100,000 people on Twitter saying that they're going to uh, turn up with, uh, that they're really angry and they're going to never buy another one of this person's CDs again, for example. So it went from crime to people feeling hurt. And I personally remember, I personally remember something similar when I was teaching at a university. Now I was teaching in about, at a university and I was teaching about depression. And, and you, you can't teach about depression and avoid the topic suicide. You have to talk about suicide if you're teaching depression. Remember, this is university level where I'm teaching people to be health professionals. And uh, after the lecture and so on and so forth, I get an email from my um, boss saying, can you come in? I want to have a chat. So I come in, I want to chat and say, look, one of the students has complained that you've really been using the word suicide a lot. I said, um, when? And I said, well, you know, that, um, that last week. And I said, well, I was teaching about depression. I, I think I have to use the word suicide when I'm teaching about depression. We can't avoid the word suicide. We can't avoid the topic. Avoiding topics, repression, does not solve a problem. Yeah, well, you know, and then my boss said, well, you know, do you think you could use some other word? Do you, could you say something else because this student is hurt? Could you send an apology email? And I said, look, First of all, the word suicide is suicide. If it ever ends up being a different word, then I'll end use up using that word for the word that it is what it is. I won't say something like, as the person departed towards the almighty heavens and lords and gently went to their slumber every time I'm trying to describe suicide, I just won't do that. Secondly, it's not my responsibility that that student does not feel hurt by words. It's their responsibility that they do therapy, they get themselves checked out, they do what they need to do so that they don't get hurt by any potential trigger. Now you might go, maybe you're not convinced yet about this argument, but again, let me show you this. Let me think about this. Another student said that I got a complaint once. I had said hi. I was walking and hi. The student complained that I seemed angry when I said hi. And he wasn't angry. I was talking to colleagues. We were having fun. I saw the student. I recognized them. And I said, hi. And I got a complaint that it seemed like I was angry at the student when I said hi. Now, could I apologize to this student for being angry? No, again, I wasn't angry. I will not apologize to saying hi to somebody. The point that I'm trying to make here is once we go down that rabbit hole of I feel hurt and my hurt equates to you must now be put to justice because I'm hurt that is the problem with cancel culture that is where the people who suddenly even the people who were like no no I want to put criminals to, to justice I do want these pedophiles to go to prison I do not want to listen to their content it just it bothers me to do so that's when they started getting their backs up and going, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. Now, anyone who hurts anyone can, can go to prison, essentially. Anyone who hurts anyone can lose their job. Now, that's that slippery slope that the people who oppose cancel culture are very much afraid of. Now, let me speak for cancel culture. In this balance of, hey, I don't want to be canceled because I said hi to a student or because I said suicide during a depression lecture, up come the people who have some really nasty things to say. Here now, all of a sudden, come in the fringes and in the corners, you know, you know, whenever there's a dark spot, whenever there's something bad happening, that's, when the, that's where the Nazis lurk. All of a sudden, all these extremely homophobic, 
highly Nazi kind of anti-women, transphobic, I, I don't know, you know, brownphobic, xenophobic people start popping up saying, well, if, if you believe that I shouldn't be canceled, I've, I've had these opinions all along, but I've just been afraid to say them. I've just been afraid to say that the whole time I thought that all trans people should be dead. I've just been afraid to say that. But if there now is movement both ways, that there is cancel culture and there is anti-cancel culture, did you know that I actually think that all transphobic people are really sick in the head and all, all gay people are really sick and all brown people are really sick? I thought that all along. Don't cancel me. It's open speech. I get to say what I want. Don't kill freedom of speech. Because if you get hurt and you don't want to know of me and you want me to be canceled, then you're actually attacking freedom of speech. Now, you might not be, you might be surprised, but this whole idea of freedom of speech versus freedom to not be oppressed and abused has always been a battle. A long time ago, if you don't know about Islam, there's a prophet in Islam called Muhammad. And this Danish uh, journalist released pictures of, of Muhammad. And in Islam, you're not allowed to uh, present Muhammad in pictorial form. Outrage. There was outrage about this. And the side that thought, we don't care about the fact that you Muslims are hurt, were quoting freedom of speech. And the side that was hurt was quoting freedom from abuse, freedom from oppression. Now, you have to think to yourself, which one is more important to you? It's important that I get to say what I want to say. It's important. And if I am, if I have judgments against uh, trans people or gay people or black people or white people or brown people or whatever, it is important that I find that there's an avenue in which I can be heard and that those uh, ideas can somewhat be, cons uh, be um, considered, discussed, looked upon, pay paid attention to. But can I expect that people don't get hurt and that they don't have a natural reaction of wanting to kick me out of my job? Well, I really can't. Because freedom of speech does not sit above all rights and values. The value of freedom of speech is extremely important, but it does not sit above all other values. There's nothing to say that the value of freedom of speech is more important than the value of not being, or the right, the value of not being oppressed, for example. There's nothing to say that one beats the other. I personally believe that the value of not being oppressed, the value of not being lynched, the value of not being hurt, the value of not being um, um, well, caught, uh, oppressed, I was going to say, um, dominated is the word that came out. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to say uh, restricted is more important that these values are often so much more important than the value of freedom of speech. I'll give you an example. I was walking on the bridge here on a beautiful Gold Coast. A guy exercises his freedom of speech as he uh, drives past me in, the, in his car and yells, um, you, um, you fucking muzi, I don't even know what that meant at the time, it means Muslim, uh, go back to your fucking country. I don't know if I'm meant to say the F word on, on YouTube or if it's going to get canceled. I don't know. Uh, I'm just saying it anyway. That's what he said. You fucking Muslim, go back to your fucking country. And hey, he's exercising his rights to freedom of speech. Did I feel right about that? Did I feel good about that? Did I feel good having to explain to my son what just happened there to my little three-year-old and say, well, this is what just happened there. That's called freedom of speech. 
And that means that now and again, you're just going to have to feel the way that you feel right now, and which is obviously he was terrified. It was, a, it was a very nasty experience. He understood, and he must have felt on my reaction too, that whatever happened there was quite nasty. So, you know, no, freedom of speech is not the, the, the prime place to go. Uh, to, it's not the one. There are many values that we can value. There are many virtues that we can value. So let's then think about what's the way forward here between the cancel culture that is extreme and ridiculous and the cancel culture that actually has a valid point around making sure that we're not oppressed and abused and, and crime is not done to us. And to the other side, the anti-cancel culture that actually makes a good point and says, hey, well, I don't want my favorite artist to disappear because he made a joke and someone got offended. And to that extreme anti-cancel culture that thinks that actually exercising their rights is more about expression of absolute, uh, you know, horrific uh, um, xenophobia, Nazi, Nazi oppression, and so on and so forth. So it's a dimension here that we have. And if we play on it as a pendulum, well, what's the solution? My solution, you might not agree, stop the edges. It's the edges that is the problem. It's in these absolute corners that there's a problem. How do we stop them? We don't do anything when they do something. It's not illegal in many countries to be a Nazi. For example, in Sweden, it's not illegal to be a Nazi. It's not illegal in many countries to be extremely hurt and offended very easily by anything that anyone says. If you're one of those people, you would have shut this video off a long time ago. You're not even here. I've offended you a thousand times by now. So if you're on these edges, the only thing that we can do at peep for, for those people in those edges is not feed their fuel. If you want Nazi organizations to be contained in countries where it's legal, for Nazi uh, organizations, then what you can do is not feed that fire, but put out that fire. And how do you put out that fire? Not by engaging in debate with them and conversing with them and fighting them, but by educating the next generation and helping one step by step, person by person know about, well, look, just because I'm Jewish, just because I'm brown, just because I'm not uh, Aryan white doesn't mean that I'm whatever, just because I'm gay doesn't mean that I'm whatever, and so on and so forth. Similarly, we need to educate this extreme cancel uh, side and saying that, look, just because I make a joke doesn't mean that it's true. Just because I have this opinion doesn't mean I'm a hurtful, harmful person. Just because I said the thing doesn't mean my intention was to hurt you. Just because I think my life matters doesn't mean I think your life doesn't matter. Just because I can see inconsistencies and inaccuracies about how things happen doesn't mean that I believe that you, what's happening to you is not horrible. This kind of really all goes back to so often when people are being unfairly lynched because they have said something that hurts someone and now that person goes and grabs a mob and wants to hurt them. I think we need to not feed that and not feeding that is in part not going in on those blogs, not tweeting about it, and instead helping people understand that when you get triggered, if you get triggered emotionally, it doesn't mean that someone caused your pain, caused your suffering, caused your hurt. We can teach people that there's a huge difference between causing harm and being triggered, between being triggered and someone having caused you to feel hurt. Now, I'll, I have made videos about being triggered versus caused. I don't know what they're called. I'll have a look at it. Uh, but I might talk about it in a future video as well. If you're interested in anything I've talked about here, if you find this uh, interesting, if you found that this was useful, now and again, I do these one-off kind of just uh, let's get educational kind of videos. If you liked it, if you like this kind of video side by side with the other kind of three-minute videos I make about ISTDP that I make about... Um, uh, attachment and that. If you like these kind of videos too, let me know because if these kind of videos don't get a lot of attention and I'm just talking to myself, who am I kidding? I'm still going to make the videos and I'm still going to release them. But please do like for the YouTube algorithm. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed it. I'll see you again next time.